Prayer is a powerful, powerful part of our walk, part of our relationship, because prayer has the ability to connect us. I have looked at a variety of information. You know how it is today. You ask somebody, do they know this? Do they know that? And they'll say, um, I don't know. Let me Google it. And so I've, I've done some of that as well. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to identify with some of these things. But prayer is an interesting subject. There are some people who are quick to pray. Uh, they just, as soon as something happens, they're quick to pray. I remember growing up, learning to drive, and uh, my mother would be in the driver's, uh, or in the passenger side, and as I was driving along, all of a sudden, when she didn't think I was paying attention or she thought something was coming, she would immediately cry out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Brother Mike. That's the water. It'll talk for just a little bit. There we go. And when we find ourselves in a, in a situation or a scenario that, that demands something we don't have, it's real easy for some people to just cry out to the Lord, to pray. For other people, prayer is very difficult. Prayer is hard because of some misunderstandings. And I'm hoping today to walk through some of those things and help people understand what prayer is from the biblical sense, from the life of Jesus. Prayer for some people is hard because it's viewed as a sign of weakness. Why would prayer be a sign of weakness? Because you're ultimately saying, I need help. And there are people who are convinced that they don't need anybody else. There are people who are convinced that they don't, they don't want to depend on someone else. And therefore, prayer, if it is viewed as a, as a point of submission, as it viewed as a point of acknowledging or, or uh, awareness that I don't have all, everything I need, then prayer can be pushed away because I can do this by myself. Prayer can be intimidating because... When you don't feel like you know how to pray, you will pull away from it. There are people who say, well, I don't pray out loud. There are people who say, I, I, I pray uh, in, in private. I remember one guy who, who really wrestled because we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Jesus said some things about prayer and he didn't think we should pray out loud at all. But when you look at the life of Jesus, you can't help but read the Gospels, which are his life story, and see that Jesus was a man of prayer. Matter of fact, E.M. Bounds wrote a book, The Complete Works of Prayer. And it's about that thick, and it is going over every aspect of prayer that you could, you could think, and, and, and he spent his time working on that. And he had this to say, and I quote, Jesus was obviously a man of prayer. And as a result of that, it is very hard for us to say that you can be Christ-like and not pray. So at some point, we've got to reconcile all of our understandings or misgivings or information or propaganda about prayer and realize that if we're really going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, if we're really going to walk as a Christ-like individual, a Christian in this day, prayer, as my wife said about the Bible last week, is mandatory. To not pray, the prophet Samuel in the book of 1 Samuel had this to say, I will not sin against God in not praying for you. The prophet Samuel told the children of Israel that by not praying for them, he was sinning against God. I would like to pose to you the reality that not only did Jesus live out an example for us to follow, but he did not leave it as an option 
when it came to prayer. I googled it. What is prayer? Here's what I came up with. Harvest Ministries said, prayer is, an essential, is as essential to knowing God and growing spiritually as breathing is to living and staying healthy. Interestingly, according to recent studies, prayer is more popular than ever among Christians today. I believe that to be very true. We have some people praying God would change the last election. We have other people praying, thank God it changed. So prayer, I believe, is on the rise. The focus of the prayer could be drastically different. But I do believe that prayer is on the rise. One recent poll showed that 8 out of 10 Americans pray regularly. Yeah. Amen. Another poll found that 73% of Americans believe that praying for people can help to cure their illness. I wonder if I could take a poll of Cornerstone today and say, anybody here know that prayer absolutely touched their lives and made a difference? Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not Greek Orthodox, but it's interesting sometimes to to look at what other people say that maybe we don't always rub shoulders with. This particular Greek Orthodox site, Greek Orthodox of America, said prayer is doxology, praise, thanksgiving, confession, supplication, and intercession to God. When I, pray, when I prayed, I was new, wrote a great theologian of Christian antiquity. But when I stopped praying, I became old. Is prayer anti-aging? Maybe that's more than just theology. Maybe there's something to that, huh? He goes on to say, prayer is a way to renewal and spiritual life. Prayer is aliveness to God. Prayer is strength, refreshment, and joy. Through the grace of God and our disciplined efforts, prayer lifts us up from the isolation to a conscious, loving communion with God in which everything is experienced in a new light. Prayer becomes a personal dialogue with God, a spiritual breathing of the soul, and a foretaste of the bliss of God's kingdom. Now, I'll tell you what, I may not know these people and rub shoulders with them, but if that's what somebody was telling me about prayer for the very first time and I had never prayed, I'm all in. I don't know about you. But if prayer, if, if this, this entity called prayer has the ability to do what they just said, why aren't all people praying? A Yiddish site called Chabad.org said the common term for prayer for those with a Yiddish background is to davin. I kind of like dive in. I like that. You dive into prayer. You just need to dive in and go for it, right? There are various theories where the word Devin came from. Some say that Devin comes from the Hebrew word Davav, which means to move the lips. I really like this. To move the lips. Remember that. So Davining is when Jews move their lips. We don't pray silently We pray verbally, vocalizing our prayers. I thought that was was an interesting part that some people have this idea, and I've even challenged people, pray in your your heart, right? Pray with your mind. Do you have to speak out loud? Well, no, because God knows your thoughts. But the Jewish people had this reality that when they were praying, they were talking. They were engaged. New City Catechism.com said, Prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. The one I kind of like the most came from Blue Letter Bible. It said, Prayer is an act. I think we've got to really remember that. Everything we know about prayer, the truth is, prayer is an act. 
Prayer is an act, not merely an attitude. This can be seen by the way the scriptures speak of people praying. It says of Jesus, he was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. The man goes on to say, notice it says that Jesus was praying, and when he finished praying, this means that prayer is an act. You begin it, and you finish it. Interestingly enough, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus outlines a prayer that follows exactly that. When he tells the disciples to pray, he starts the prayer and he ends the prayer. And I think there's a point of this that we need to understand because over my years of ministry, I've heard people say, oh, I pray all day long. I'm always praying. Well, let's fit that into the life of Jesus and make sure that we're not redefining something that was meant to be very special moments in our life with some general attitude. Because I really believe that if we don't take the time to do what Jesus did, we won't have the relationship with God that Jesus had. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Troy, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up. The New King James has been our memory verse over the years at this time of the year. We emphasize six different things that Jesus was very uh, adamant about. He was also very much committed to in, his, in the beginning of his ministry. The very first thing he was committed to, we, we found in week number one, he left things behind. It says he left Nazareth. And there's a whole lot into that. And if, you, if you'd like to know more, we'd love to visit with you about it. The second thing Jesus did was he submitted himself to, the, to baptism, both water and spirit. The third thing he did was he committed himself to a time of fasting, time of denying himself, setting himself apart, not just from his home, not just from his family, but setting himself apart from society and the things of society in order to focus in on what God had in store and what was coming down the road. The next thing we learned last week was the value of God's word. And if you ever look at the life of Christ from that point, he knew his Bible. Now, at that point, we didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all the way through Revelation. So he only had to learn the Old Testament. But let me tell you, he knew it. And when the devil came at him, he knew what to use. Not his reputation, not his personality, not his strength, but it is written. So today, when we see the reality of God's emphasis through the life of Christ in the area of prayer... Let us be very aware that this needs to be a huge part of our demonstration of our love for Him. Why pray? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. How many of you have that memorized? All right, so most of you don't. So we would like to help you because this is really good stuff. So let's read it together. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Where is it found? Very good. This is a huge part of what we believe is necessary for us as Christians. If Jesus stood upon the word, we too should be standing upon the word. And if we have a reason to pray, the very first part of this verse lays that out very clearly. If you'll notice, Troy put that back up there real quick, the very first two words, or the very first phrase says, be anxious for nothing. Have you noticed how often you hear the word phobia in the news today? 
We've got all kinds of phobias around. But it seems in the last several months, there has been a rise of the use of the word phobia. They use so many different phobias, I had to look some up. They started using xenophobia. And I was like, who's scared of zen? I thought zen was supposed to be a good thing, or I'm not sure what it is, so I looked it up. Anybody here know what xenophobia is? You hear it on the news all the time, right? They're xenophobic. There's, what's xenophobia mean? Strangers, yeah. It's basically fear of somebody who's not like you. We got people who are scared of other people who aren't like them. That makes the world a very scary place. Because guess what? The person sitting next to you isn't just like you. Right? I mean, you carry these things out and you're like, wow. We live in a scary place. Of course, we've heard of homophobia. We've heard of, uh, you know, the fear of heights. We've heard of all kinds of phobias going around. I'm convinced that there's some that aren't being addressed. I think there's a fear of God's word. I would like to call it Bible phobia. I think there's a fear of fellowship. Fear of phobia. Fellowship of phobia. Yeah, fear of fear. <laughs> That's what the one famous guy said. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. That's fear phobia. The reality is we live in scary times. And in scary times, in fearful times, we need something bigger than ourselves to help us through these times of fear. There's a fear of being yourself. Now, bear with me just a moment. I promise I won't take this very long. But we, have, we are living in a society today where if you happen to be a certain demographic, you begin to feel like you should be scared of yourself because you don't get it. Get what? You don't get other people. You don't get their language. You don't get their customs. You don't get their cultures. And all of a sudden, there's this thing, and, and hear me out here, please. There's this thing going on in our world today, and it's going in America especially, where if you are not a minority, you're the problem. If we ever need to pray, it is in this day we live. If we ever need something that can keep us from being anxious about the stuff that's going around in our world, it is today. And as, as Jesus begins to prepare us for heaven, one of the things that is going to be a part of that is prayer. Because here's one misconception conception people have about prayer. They think prayer has the ability to get God to do what they want. If you just pray hard enough, if you just pray long enough, if you just pray the right prayers, if you just pray and they begin to define things, and ultimately what you see at the bottom of this, at the root, the motivation of it, is how can I get what I want from God? While prayer has the ability to connect us to God, I would propose to you that the main emphasis and motivation of prayer is not to get God to change to what we want, but to get us into a place where we're thinking like God. So it's not about changing God, it's not about changing history, not about changing the future, it's about putting myself in a position where I can start thinking bigger than myself. I can begin to embrace life from God's perspective, not from mine. Have you ever wished for something and then you got it and you wish you hadn't ever wished for it? <laughs> Sometimes we use prayer just like that. So the very first part of this verse says, be anxious for nothing. If we ever need to be people of prayer, it is the day we live in because there's so many phobias that people are promoting as an excuse to do a lot of things that shouldn't be done. The next part of this verse states very clearly why we pray. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. The purpose of prayer has got to be focused on more than just what I want. 
The purpose of prayer has got to be an opportunity to say thank you for what I have. Prayers of thanksgiving are becoming a challenge because our self-centeredness tends to override our awareness of what God has so lovingly provided. Why pray? Because we need to be thankful. Why pray? Because there's times of fear abounding. Why pray? Because we're a needy people. You look at that word, make your requests. We are needy people. Not one of you this morning got up, rolled out of bed, got in and just appeared at church. Every one of you in this room needed to take a shower. Needed to comb your hair. You needed to eat. You needed a car to get here. You needed clothes. You need the air God provided. You are a needy person. I am a needy person. And the moment we think that we don't need anything is about the time we set ourselves up on a nice big platform called pride. And the Bible clearly states that pride comes before a fall. The best way to wake up in the morning is something that I have begun to put in my life for 20 years now. When my eyes wake open, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Before my feet touch the ground, before I roll out of the bed, I am consciously reminding myself that I didn't make myself. I am constantly reminding that I can't sustain myself by myself. I'm a needy person. Why pray? Because I have needs. Why pray? Because there's a God who loves me. Look at the end of that verse. Let your requests be made known to God. Notice it does not in any way allow for anything else to be put in the mix. It is God. It doesn't say, let your requests be made known to God and any other agency that you think might be able to help. Now, can God use other people, other agencies? Absolutely. But ultimately, if you're really going to find the true direction and answer and freedom in life, go to the one who made you. Go to the one who loves you. Go to the one who cares about you. Go to the one who wants to see you in eternity forever. You ever realize that when you go to the doctor, they only have so much time for you? That's why they make you make an appointment. And you all have been, I hope so, I hope I'm not lying here, but I think most of you have been in the waiting room and you look at the clock and it's past the appointment time. And so when you finally get in, you feel like you're pushed because you know the doctor's running late, but you really have this problem. Do you realize that when you go to prayer with God, he is never late and he's never in a hurry and he's always got the time to take for as long as you need? You ever realize that? You ever thought about that? And yet, inevitably, one of the first things that happens in our human mind is, I don't have time to pray. Another good question is where to pray. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said this, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. This address to prayer is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was instructing his listeners in certain things that had been totally misunderstood, totally blown out. 
And prayer is one of those things. Back in the day that Jesus was walking through the streets of Jerusalem, there were men, women, people who would find themselves an opportunity to brag about or boast or promote themselves in using this area of prayer. And what Jesus is saying here is, when you pray, don't be like Hollywood. I mean the actors. Don't be like those who find themselves with an opportunity to promote themselves being somebody that they're really not. Now, if you just follow that whole little tirade there, you know what I'm talking about when I accidentally on purpose put in Hollywood instead of hypocrites because the truth is (laughs) acting like somebody you're not is hypocritical. And to get paid, big bucks, to be somebody you're not, it's ridiculous. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Prayer. When you pray, Jesus said there's a way to do this. There's a place to do it. Not on the street corner. Now let me just say real quick, what Jesus is saying here is not to pray, ever pray outside, But he is saying, when you pray outside, don't pick a place where everybody can see you. Don't do it so you can demonstrate something that you're not. He says this, when you pray, go to your room. The King James uses the word closet. As a result, many of of my uh, uh, people that grew up before me, my elders, they would always talk about, I was in the prayer closet. I remember one, the, the, the war... Uh, war room wasn't it the war room this lady takes a whole closet and she pulls everything out and she puts in nothing but what will encourage her in prayer and she challenges somebody else to do and if you haven't seen the movie war room you need to see it because she challenges this other young lady to find a room and the and and the the lady finds a room and it's her walk-in closet she takes everything out and puts in and i thought that's awesome but what jesus is saying there's a place If you really want to get into the depths of prayer, there's a place for that. If you really want God's attention, set yourself apart. He says, go into your room when you shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not use vain repetitions, he goes on to say, for they think they will be heard for their many words. I grew up as a Pentecostal kid, missionary's kid, who was around people who knew how to pray. I mean, and they didn't care who was in the room. They were going to pray, and they were going to give it everything they got. They must have learned from the Jews that when you pray, you move your lips. And they moved their lips, and they moved their vocal cords, and they put themselves into that prayer. And I remember in certain times that there would be wailing and groaning and, and all kinds of stuff. Some of you folks, you walk into that prayer room, you're like, whoo! Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and some of the whoo wasn't, this is weird. Some of the woe was, I just walked into an atmosphere. I just walked into a special sacred place and I'm challenging you when Jesus says where to pray, he's telling you if you really want the in-depth connection that prayer can bring, don't try to do it in front of everybody so everybody can see. Find a place where you can dig in. Find a place where you can get honest before God. Find a place where you can cry and you're not embarrassed. Find a place where you can let the snot roll down your nose and you don't mind. Find a place where you can cry out, Oh, God, help me! Amen. Those are special times of prayer. When to pray. Luke 18, Jesus spoke a parable to them and he said, men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And then he goes on to tell a story of a widow who needed help from a judge. And the judge is recorded here, Jesus says, the judge said he did not fear God nor man. But the widow would not stop. She persisted. She constantly came over and over and over again. 
And then Jesus says, and the judge actually finally relents, and he says, I do not fear God, and I do not regard man, but because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming wearies me. Then Jesus said this, listen. Hear what the unjust said, Jesus said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will revenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? When do we pray? Jesus uses this illustration to say, when you're in need. When you need something from God, you you, you pray. God doesn't look at mankind and say, well, you're just wanting something, huh? You ever had that? Somebody call you and say, hey, how are you doing? Man, you are the best person I have ever met. You're like, yeah, what do you want? God doesn't feel that way. When you come knocking, he's got time. When you come knocking, he already knows what you're going to ask for. When you come knocking, he's already got it supplied. Some people say, well, then why pray? Because prayer is a connector. Prayer is a recognizer that you're not God. And I don't care who you are. We all need that reminder every once in a while. Luke 21, answering the question, when to pray? He says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus emphasizes something that we better be aware of. Your ability to stand before God is connected to your prayer life. The next time somebody says that prayer is not important, or maybe the next time you think about, well, maybe I don't need to pray, you need to remember this verse, because there's some things coming that will need more than what you have on your own. There are some things that are coming to America that we better be ready for, and the only way that we're truly going to make it through is if we have vested ourselves in something greater than us. If we have connected with God in such a way that when times get tough or when times get successful, we find ourselves able to keep the faith. God's word declares in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without ceasing. This is where some people have this idea that somehow they can pray like Jesus prayed and pray all day long. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe there is an attitude of prayer that allows us to be able to have that lifestyle of submission where everything in life is Lord willing. Everything in life is constantly checked against God's word, constantly measured against what did Jesus do. But the idea that prayer is an act And the idea that Paul would say, pray without ceasing, leads us to this point where we realize that there is a constant lifestyle where prayer is not a promotion of self, but prayer and the lifestyle of prayer is a promotion of God's greatness in our lives. To pray without ceasing is not to spend all day long at the church. To pray without ceasing is not to call your employer and say, I can't come to work today because Pastor Mike said I should be praying in my closet, so I'll be in the closet. Just send the paycheck anyway. (laughs) Ain't going to happen. But to pray without ceasing is to wake up in the morning, put your eyes and your heart on God, to be at the meal table and constantly say, God, you provided my food. To be at the lunch table, God provided my food. When you get to a green light, and you know you got to get through that green light. You go through the green light and say, God, thank you for living me that green light. You say, Pastor Mike, no, that's, that's ridiculous. It's only ridiculous if you don't think God cares about everything. But if God cares about everything, then I'm as thankful for the sunshine as I am 
for the very breath I breathe. I'm thankful for the meal, whether it's a bowl of cereal or it's a filet mignon. I'm thankful whether I feel healthy or whether I'm sick. I'm thankful whether I have everything I need or I'm really needy that day and don't have and don't know where I'm going to get it. In everything I can give thanks because prayer is not just getting, it is giving. Prayer is thanking. Prayer is staying in constant contact. So if somebody says they're praying all day long and they're constant, by saying that, they're saying they're constantly in contact with God, listen to me, their life better reflect it. You can't be constantly praying and holding a grudge. You can't be constantly praying and then go swear the very name you just got done saying, amen. Don't tell me you're constantly praying all day long. Don't tell me you're living an attitude or a lifestyle of prayer when your life says opposite. That's why David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, my brain, my thoughts bring glory to you. Why? Because we're called into this lifestyle. So how do we pray? I want to debunk something. If I were to today say, let's all pray, most of you in this room would automatically do several things. Some of you would fold your hands, because we've been taught. Some of you would automatically close your eyes, and some of you would bow your heads. Try this. Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Take heed, watch, and pray. For you do not know when the time is. In Mark 14, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Luke chapter 21. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Anybody know who said that? Anybody want to guess? Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's very appropriate to be respectful during prayer. But I'm here to tell you, if from this point on, you watch me while I pray, You are in line with Jesus, and that's all that matters. The idea, and I remember years ago somebody talking about delivering, delivering prayer, delivering ministry, and how they, they finally, finally realized, you know what? When I'm praying with somebody who's got a demon, I better watch and pray. Because the devil has already got control of that person's body and that devil will use that person's hand to slap me upside the head. And if I'm sitting here with my eyes closed, I may get knocked out and it won't be slain in the spirit. It'll be knocked out by not being aware. So I've realized that, you know what, some of the things that we put into, what does it mean to pray? I'm all about kneeling down. I'm all about bowing my head. I'm all about closing my eyes. But the reason I do those things is so I can position myself mentally and physically in a position of humility and submission to the very one I'm praying to. That's why Jesus told the story of the, of the, the Pharisee and, the, and the, the, uh, the publican who came. And the Pharisee looked to heaven and stood and beat his chest and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. He began to list off his accomplishments for the week. The, the publican laid, knelt down and said, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, Which one of those prayers do you think God heard? Had nothing to do with whether one was standing or kneeling had nothing to do with whether one was standing looking to heaven or one was bowing his head. It had everything to do with what was inside. So how do we pray? We watch him pray. But Jesus did more than that. He said, he said I'm going to give you a model to pray. And we have sung it. We have prayed it. 
Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed me thy name. Do you realize that that first statement is an acknowledgement that you are not God? Jesus starts this prayer with a recognition that I am not all-powerful. I'm not all-knowing. I'm not, I, I don't get it all. Therefore, I appeal to the one who knows it all, the one who can do it all, the one who is all. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's an act of submission. Give us this day our daily bread. That's an act of dependence. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's an act of admission. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. That's an act of protection, a plea for protection. And then for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory is a declaration that all things ultimately are for His glory, created by Him, created for Him, and my life is right in the middle of that. You are where you are today because of some of the choices you made in life. But if you could see your life from God's perspective, you would see that He has the ability to open doors that no man can open and shut doors that no man can shut. And He has the ability to work and guide and direct and walk with and walk before and walk behind each and every one of us in such a way that when it's all said and done and we ultimately stand before the throne, we will have to confess He knew it all along. The question is not whether God knows what He's doing. The question is not whether God can do what needs to be done. The question is, are you going to join him or are you going to fight against him? I want to wrap this up by challenging us with the who of prayer. Who do we pray to? We pray to God. God who is the creator. Not one of the creators, but the creator. We pray to God, who is, by virtue of creator, our father. By virtue of our adoption spiritually, our father. We pray to God, who is our savior. Isaiah declared it over and over again. There is no other God. There is no other Savior. There is no other Redeemer. When we pray to God, He is our God, our supplier, our provider, our protector. He is our Redeemer, our Savior. He is everything we need. And I'm convinced that until you and I come to that revelation that He is all I need, we'll constantly find ourselves challenged trusting something else. So we pray to God. Who do we pray for? Pretty simple. Everything and everyone. Did I leave anything out? I think that covers it, right? 1 Timothy 2. Therefore, I exalt, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority. Just about the time you think you can start complaining about who's president, or who's mayor, or who's governor, you need to be reminded God has a plan for them and a plan for you. Who do we pray to? God. Who do we pray for? Everything and everyone. Who do we pray with? I want to challenge us in this time of multiculturalism. You need to realize that the table of the devil and the table of the Lord are opposed 
to one another. And when you endeavor to embrace the light of the world, you need to be very aware that when somebody says, let's pray, they may not fall into the category of those with a like precious faith. Do you realize that the Buddhists pray? The Hindus pray? Satanists pray? New Age pray? Universalists pray? Atheists pray? Some of you are like, nah, nah, you just stepped off the boat. If prayer is connection... If prayer is submission, if prayer is those things, then even the person who doesn't believe in God still finds themselves praying. Interestingly enough, years ago in our English language, we would have terms like pray tell. We would have terms like, I pray of you. Sentences that were used with that word pray. Today we kind of narrowed it down in a lot of circles to the point where people think prayer is just something you do at church. But if prayer is connecting, if prayer is submitting, and if prayer is asking and making requests, then guess what? When you start to ask the bank, are you not submitting to them? When you start to ask the credit card? Are you not submitting to them? I know it may be a challenge for you to think that way, but I want you to seriously think, when you are trusting something besides God, you find yourself in danger of idolatry. We pray with those of like precious faith. We pray with those who are hurting and confused. We pray with those who are repentant. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus did not join with everyone that came across his path. There were people, he said, don't pray like them. And I would venture to say, if he ever got invited to a street corner, he probably graciously refused to join why is that so important? Because the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, right? He's there. The Bible tells us that we can pray amiss, which means your prayers, yeah, you're praying, but you're not connecting. It says we can pray selfishly. The reason why this is such an important part is because you and I have got to realize that we were called into fellowship. And there are battles going on out there. There are people who want you to join in their prayer meetings, not so they can change, but so that your prayer justifies them. I got a whole lot deeper than I should have today. I can tell. I realize that this is a challenging area, but I'm telling you, there are people out there who are P-R-E-Y on your prayer life. They're praying on your faith. They're praying on your trust in God. They want you to pray so they don't have to. That's not the design. And if you're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, let your prayer life line up with his and let us join in his passion. He said, I don't do anything without first seeing. I don't say anything without first hearing. I wonder what a different world Idaho Falls would be if we operated in that same way. Prayer, it's not just a pastime. It's a lifestyle. Prayer, it's not a waste of time. 
It's the best investment of time in light of eternity as well as your very next breath.